Our next speaker, Philippe Rushton, is probably best known as the author of Race, Evolution, and Behavior, which I believe sets forth a brilliantly original theory about the meaning and nature of racial differences. And many of you are, of course, familiar with the hysterical opposition that greeted this book, and in fact, virtually all of Professor, Professor Rushton's work. And this opposition has even included government investigations into whether his research violates Canadian hate crime laws. Now, by this time, race, uh, evolution, and behavior has been in available in paperback and has been translated even into Japanese. The Japanese, needless to say, are rather more receptive to, receptive to common sense on these matters than some other groups. The book's uh, most recent appearance has been in a, an abridged pocket size a popular edition, which likewise has provoked its own little waves of outrage. Uh, Race, Evolution, and Behavior is only one of Professor Rushton's six books, and he's written hundreds of scholarly papers. He's a professor of psychology at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and he has been a recipient of many honors. And he will today speak to us on latest research about race, and uh, I suspect you will find that much of his material uh, has not uh, been graced with uh, any media coverage, much less major media coverage. So I think you'll find some very interesting findings from Professor Rushton. <clears throat> Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, the first slide is actually a postcard from South Africa, which I was very fortunate to be able to visit about a year and a half ago, uh, the new South Africa. Um, it is a fascinating country. When you arrive in Johannesburg, as I did, uh, you see a very modern skyline. In fact, it's very uh, undifferentiable from any American city or Canadian city. The roads are big super highways and the motor cars are modern. Even the people on the streets and driving the cars, for the most part, um, are indistingu indistinguishable from North America. Um, on the other hand, uh, South Africa is a city of, uh, a country of contrasts, and there's a great deal of traditional society as well. And the reason I was in South Africa um, is because um, of this particular chart which summarizes IQ scores that Professor Richard Lynn alluded to in his talk uh, based on his review, which was published in 1991. Uh, East Asians, both here in the United States and Canada, as well as in their home continents, that's Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans, average a slightly higher IQ than do white people. Uh, the average I have there is 106. Sometimes you see the average is a little bit lower, around 103. Uh, whites average about 100. A few estimates may place it a little bit higher and say 103. Uh, black Americans average about 85. And again, uh, blacks in Canada or Britain or in the Caribbean average around 85 too, maybe slightly higher, up as high as 90. But it's the very far bar on that graph which has excited a lot of controversy, the IQ of 70 because an IQ of 70 is the lowest IQ ever found in the world. And it's based on 20 or 30 different studies from East, South, West, and Central uh, Africa. And it really doesn't seem to change even if you select the population to be studied from um, people in primary school, uh, people who got jobs, people in urban centers. In other words, samples that might be thought to have a slightly higher IQ, um, the average of 70 to maybe 75 consistently comes out. When the bell curve was published in 1994, this really elevated uh, Richard Lynn's review to international um, uh, appraisal. And a lot of people in the United States were um, outraged uh, and very, very critical. In fact, they trashed uh, the bell curve in my own book, uh, partly because we uh, discussed, as a serious piece of data, the average IQ of 70. Indeed, uh, some members who, of the academic community who were in favor of the bell curve uh, decided that this was an embarrassment to their perspective. They actually argued something like, look, uh, perhaps within the academic and intelligentsia circles of America, with the bell curve behind us, we just might be able to convince people 
that uh, IQ is a predictive variable, that it's partly heritable, that there is a black-white difference for whatever reason. But how on earth are we ever going to make headway when there are these extremists like Richard Lynn and uh, Phil Rushton and depending on which side they got out of the bed that morning, uh, Charles Murray and Arthur Jensen, who actually take this seriously, that the Africans have an IQ as low as 70 to 75. Um, I should put it into context. If white people in, Can in Canada or the United States have an IQ of 70, this is considered borderline mentally retarded. So to, to, to uh, label an entire continent as having an average IQ of 70, in which case 50% of the African population fall below an IQ of 70. 50% of the African continent by white standards is mentally retarded, is the sort of uh, preposterous sounding um, rhetoric that uh, academics have to face. So what's the cause of that IQ of 70? Can it be real or is it somehow false? So I went to South Africa essentially in search of a high IQ African population. I decided I really needed for my own sake to at least satisfy uh, myself as to what the true or uh, well what the true African IQ score was. Had Richard Lynn underestimated um, the African IQ. So I searched for a top university within Johannesburg. Um, some of my colleagues were arguing and saying uh, look we know there are many top African students at Harvard and Berkeley and Stanford or Oxford and Cambridge in England or even at top-notch uh, universities in South Africa. Boy, if you could only test their IQs, uh, you'd find that they were just as bright or almost as bright as uh, the genius level uh, physicists in North America. Uh, so I went to um, South Africa to look for um, uh, a high IQ group. I teamed up with um, a group of people uh, who shall still remain anonymous until the article is actually published in about three months' time. Uh, we had um, Africans and Cape Coloreds as well as our assistants. Uh, for those who uh, actually do these tests and so on, it's sometimes considered that test takers need to be tested by members of their own race and so on. Um, we can have the next one. Uh, I, I went to South Africa myself rather than let my collaborators collect the data because I was very concerned that uh, perhaps all the other IQ tests that had been given had been given under very poor conditions. And I wanted to absolutely standardize the conditions and satisfy for myself as well as I possibly could the integrity of the testing. Uh, what we did, we had 300 first year undergraduate psychology students. Um, half of whom were black and half of whom were white, and we paid them 10 US dollars uh, for taking part. Uh, we had a huge exam hall, and uh, so they couldn't possibly read each other's answers. It was proctored and monitored by uh, five of our assistants. Um, I myself prowled up and down these uh, rows, looking and making sure that everybody did this, the test studiously. Um, we gave clear instructions that this was a very, very simple test, which I'm going to describe in a minute. Um, but most people finish it within 20 minutes. But we said you could not leave your seat, in fact, for the first 30 minutes. We figured this would ensure that people didn't just uh, slap dash out their answers and collect the $10 and leave. They may as well stay there and do the answers. But in fact, it wasn't even timed. We said you could stay there for an hour and a half and finish the test if you wanted to double check and quadruple check your answers. So it was a stress, it was a perfect testing conditions that I can imagine. Um, we can go to the next one. This is one of the tests. It's a very well known Raven's Progressive Matrices. It's nonverbal, uh, so uh, you don't even have to use language uh, to explain it. And what you have to do essentially is to pick from the array of answers at the bottom the piece that is missing from the top. And if you examine the top there, you can see that there's a circle with a couple of lines, which goes into a circle with a full line, and then there's a square with a couple of lines, and you're looking for what does it turn into. And you look around the bottom there, and you'll see that there is, in fact, a square with a, a, a full half bottom, and that's the correct answer. Um, 
which is number six, I believe. What? <laughs> it is number six, is the correct answer. Well, uh, the white university students get 90% of uh, this particular item correct. The African students, 77% of them get it correct. So there's no question that it's a very, very easy item for the vast majority of Africans. They know what is expected of them and they answer the question. It's just that more of them fail this particular item than do the whites. I have the next one. Now this is a much more complicated one, so avert your eyes if you didn't do well on the last one. <laughs> Uh, you now have to choose from an array of eight at the bottom, and the whole test is much more difficult. But if you examine, if you go down the left-hand column, for example, of answers, you'll see that you've got three kinds of uh, symbols there. You've got a diagonal, you've got a, you've got a vertical line, you've got a, a vertical and a horizontal, and you've got a horizontal line. And so in each of these uh, columns, you're looking for a horizontal, a vertical and a, and a cross, and so what's missing in the bottom? And then the other cue you're looking for is the background. Uh, you know, do you have a plain background, or do you have lattice work, or do you have crossed lattice work? And so you combine them, and eventually you figure it out. And don't forget, you have a whole minute and a half to do this uh, single item. Anyway, this is another one of the more complicated items, and uh, about 88% of whites pass it, and just under 70% of blacks pass it. Um, we may as well go to the next one. What's the answer? Uh, D8. Do you want to put it back on? Sorry, I, I didn't realize. It, what is it? Number one? Oh, it's number one. Oh, yeah. Oh, D8 is the item number. <laughs> number one is the correct answer. I'm informed. Okay, these are the results. There were 60 of those items altogether. Um, and they started off very, very easy. The, one, the two you saw were medium to high in difficulty. These are the answers. These are the bell-shaped curves that you often see. They're not smoothed, and so they don't look quite like the bell curves. But uh, the African scores peak considerably lower uh, down than do the uh, white scores. In fact, the average Africans get 44 out of 60 correct, whereas the whites got 54 out of 60 correct. Now, 44 out of 60 correct is roughly, according to the norms of the test, what a 14-year-old junior uh, high school student in America gets. And these are first-year university students. Putting it into an IQ context, getting 44 out of 60 correct is an IQ of 84. An IQ of 84 is substantially higher, it's about a standard deviation higher, than an IQ of 70, which is the African population. But it implies that since most university students are one standard deviation higher than the average, and the, uh, and the university students have 84, then the average for the South African population as a whole must be about 70. And therefore, this search for a high IQ population um, supported uh, Richard Lynn's uh, uh, um, review of all the previous literature showing an IQ of 70. Um, so that seems to hold up. Now the question is why? Why should the, the IQ be so low? Um, this is Soweto, um, which is a, a township, or in fact now it's a suburb of Johannesburg. And as you can see, there's abject poverty. Um, these are uh, little tin shacks with no running water, no electricity, um, and uh, there's no street lighting. It's uh, terrible crimes out there at nighttime. And you can imagine if you had a child of your own going to school, coming home, and uh, sitting in a, in a place like this with um, many extended family members, he's not going to go off to a little study and fire up his home computer or go down to the local library and so on. I mean, conditions really are very bad. And so perhaps these are the sorts of factors that do contribute some source of variance to um, IQ scores. 
But on the other hand, there is now a wealth of literature to show that brain size is uh, highly heritable, uh, IQ scores are highly heritable, and that there are significant and substantial differences between the races in brain size. Um, and this has been known for 150 years. It may have disappeared off the scientific radar screen, but Charles Darwin actually referred to black-white differences in brain size as a scientific set of facts, which were well known at that time, in order to support his then controversial theory of the human evolution. Well, today the whole thing is reversed. Now evolution is much less controversial among scientists, but race differences in brain size uh, nobody knows anything about, even though uh, many, many studies continue to appear showing uh, the black-white differences. The magnitude of the differences, whites have on average about 6% uh, more neurons and cranial, capacity, cranial size than do um, blacks, and East Asians may have up to a 2% advantage over whites. We know that there's a positive correlation between brain size and IQ because especially now uh, the state-of-the-art uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, studies which are coming out once a month, once every two months, where you can actually take a picture of the person's brain just before you give them an IQ test or just after you've given them an IQ test. And there are lots of studies done. And the average correlation is about 0.4 between brain size measured this way and IQ scores. As I said, the race differences in brain size are um, absolutely uh, hard facts. Uh, this particular study shows from birth onwards. Uh, this was a huge uh, national collaborative perinatal project that was uh, carried out by the National Institutes of Health. And they broke everything down by race. They didn't um, always uh, publish the results this way, but you could go into the archives and dig it out and recover it in the way that I've put onto this screen. And it shows essentially that Asians, whites, and blacks at birth are actually born with um, the racially predictable uh, brain size differences. At four months, one year, four years, and seven years, as well as in adulthood, these brain size differences remain. Uh, furthermore, um, in this particular study, at age four and at age seven, all the children were given IQ tests, and there were about 50,000. It was a huge, huge study. In every one of the racial groups, those Asians with larger heads were more intelligent than those Asians with smaller heads. Those blacks with larger heads were more intelligent than those blacks with smaller heads. Now, the correlation is quite small as far as external head size. It's about 0.2. Uh, so you wouldn't want to look at somebody's head and try and predict their IQ scores. Uh, you'd, you'd be much better off giving them an IQ test. But it just is that there is a relationship. And when you look at big groups, uh, such as blacks and whites, um, then brain size is a very big predictor of the group average differences. Um, this is uh, some cute baby pictures, rather politically correct babies. Um, but it does show that babies come in all kinds of shapes, sizes, and colors. These, um, you can easily measure head size in a baby. In fact, one of the uh, standard measurements at birth is to put a tape measure around the head and then uh, make sure that it's not abnormal in some way, too large a head or too small a head. And those head sizes are predictive. Uh, the thing, though, that you can tell from this picture is just what a proportion of a human being is the size of the brain. As we get older and as adults, our heads are a much smaller fraction of our overall body than it is when we're babies. And these babies have very large heads for their uh, body size. Now, in evolutionary terms, this has required a tremendous amount of reorganization of the human body. Uh, this is, for example, the birth canal. Uh, Large-brained babies pose a serious problem, a, a life threat, to mothers who give birth to them. Consequently, you would expect that white women have a larger pelvis and a larger birth canal than do black women. And they do. The differences are there on the screen. 
Um, I haven't actually gone on the screen. I don't have the data in front of me, uh, but I understand that the prediction is, does come out that East Asian women have an even larger birth canal uh, than white women. Um, and this is as an accommodation over evolutionary terms in order to uh, give birth to large-brained babies. Uh, this is me with a couple of my skeletal friends. Um, I'm a psychologist and the stock in trade that I um, uh, ply my living with is paper and pencil tests, such as the IQ test that I was telling you about earlier that I took to South Africa. But my fiance, Elizabeth, who is working the slides for me and I actually made up all the slides for me, um, is a physical anthropologist. And so we have teamed up to uh, do some analyses on progress and evolution. And uh, it's been an eye-opener for me just how incredibly interesting race differences are in the skeleton. These are lower jaws. And if you look at the base of the jaw, uh, you will see, perhaps counterintuitively, that this area here is less wide than this area here. In other words, blacks have a less wide back jaw than do white people. Even though most people would think, well, blacks have big jaws because they're much longer, they're heavier, they're more prognathic, they stick out in front of the face and so on. But at the back of the jaw, whites are actually wider than are, um, than are blacks. And this is the upper jaw. Asians, the one on the left here, see here is much wider than whites. Why should this be? Well, it makes perfect sense if you think of the expansion of the brain size. As the brain expands, it expands wide. Now, one of the directions it expands is wide. It becomes more globular, more circular. Um, and as it does so, it has cascading effects all through the skeleton, all through the skull. One of the things it does is it takes those jaw bones with it. The jaws have to widen so that they can attach to the base of the head, which is now wider to accommodate the much bigger brain. So these brain size differences between the races even show up at the back of the jaws. Um, there are all kinds of muscle attachment sites in the head. Um, the parts circled in red, uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, are some little protuberances to which muscles attach. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side there that this is more spiked in blacks than in whites. and Asians, it's even more curved. Uh, the more spiked it is and the more spikes there are, the more muscles can attach. What this tells you is that there's a lot more muscle attachments in the black skull than there is in the white skull, and more muscle attachments in the white skull than there is in the East Asian skull. Again, why? Well, because as the brain expands, it does so at the expense of what else is in, is in, the, in the skull. Now, this is a skull right behind the... If you look at the yellow arrowhead here, this is a big indentation. In fact, you can almost feel it in yourself. Right behind the eye, there is a indentation in the skull. It's called the post-orbital constriction. And this post-orbital constriction is larger in Australopithecus and chimp chimpanzees than it is in Homo erectus. It's larger in blacks than it is in whites, larger in whites than it is in East Asians. Uh, the red line that goes down, uh, there's actually a hole there behind that little uh, bone, if you can see it, is where muscles attach. Huge muscles that go from the top of the head down through the cheekbone underneath the jaw. You've probably all seen the poor embarrassed person who falls asleep on the subway train and his jaw drops open uh, and he has, he has no idea that he's holding it. Uh, because consciously you have to hold the jaw closed. And when you relax those temporalis muscles, the jaw drops open. Well, the muscles are much bigger in blacks than they are in whites, or bigger in whites than they are in Asians, because they have to hold up a big jaw. The reason why uh, 
blacks, well, Asians have smaller jaws than say blacks is because again, as the brain expanded, it had to do so at somebody or something's expense. And what it did was it filled in that hole and filled in the post-orbital constriction and took away the muscles. <coughs> Consequently, the muscular gets less, the jaw has to get less. And if you go through all the jaw features, uh, things like the size of the jaw, uh, the number of teeth in the jaw, uh, the, the depths of the roots in the jaw, and so on, blacks have more teeth, uh, larger teeth, larger roots, and a bigger jaw. Um, and Asians have fewer teeth, with uh, smaller teeth, uh, with fewer, uh, shorter roots. Now this is a, Taboo is a new book that just came out by John Entine, uh, Why Do Blacks Do So Well at Sports and Why Are We Afraid to Talk About It, um, is now going to be explained by me in terms of brain size expansion. These are the variables that blacks have advantages of in sports, if you read Entine's book. Things like 3 to 19 percent more testosterone, uh, broader shoulders, narrower hips, that's significant. More muscle, less fat, greater bone density, higher center of gravity, uh, faster knee-jerk reaction, higher percentage of fast twitch muscles, longer arms, and distal elongation of segments, which basically means that blacks have longer hands relative to forearms, relative to upper arms, compared to whites who have longer distal uh, elements than do East Asians. Um, but let me draw your attention to, I believe, the hips. Is it? Can I? No, what's the next one? Was that the next one? <laughs> okay, the thigh bone. Um, blacks have narrow hips. It gives them an advantage at running um, because the thigh bone, which comes out of the hip, can go directly, vertically straight down to the knee. The knee has to be directly underneath the body in order to give it support. And so you have an, a very efficient, straightforward stride. Whereas, as the hips expand sideways, say in East Asians, the thigh bone comes out of those hips at an angle and has to curve back down into the knees, which again, still have to be directly under the body to support it. And then you get large platforms at the knee joint. And um, in fact, if you find a skeleton in your backyard and you call in the police, the police will call in a physical anthropologist, a forensic anthropologist. And it's really quite amazing what they can tell even just from a thigh bone. Not only will they tell you how old the skeleton is or whether it's a male or a female, but they'll also tell you what race it is. So for those who say race is only skin deep and so on, a forensic anthropologist say, well, you know, you, you may not be able to tell from the skin, but you can certainly tell from the bones. White bones, East Asian bones, have much more of a curve on them than do black bones. It's one of the reasons why whites and East Asians even less are good at running and jumping uh, and playing basketball and so on. Blacks have an advantage at sports because they have narrow hips and straight, energetically efficient thigh bones. But they have energetically efficient thigh bones and hips because they have smaller brains. The large brain had these cascading effects throughout the body that made locomotion just a little bit less efficient. Now, this is an interesting bell curve because it looks like a bell curve for IQ scores. In fact, it's the bell curve for knee joints. Uh, uh, some angle at which the thigh bone meets the knee uh, pretty well mirrors the IQ differences between blacks and whites. Now, I would hazard a, hazard a prediction, uh, but I could easily be proven wrong, that you could actually measure people's uh, angle at the knee and predict what kind of IQ score or brain size uh, they would have. Um, this is uh, brain size of progress in evolution over evolutionary time. Uh, it shows 
the e expansion, the encephalization of the brain, the hominid brain, over the last four million years. Four million years ago, Australopithecus, our ancestors, distant, distant ancestors, something like a chimpanzee, had a brain size of about 400 cubic centimeters. Um, two million years ago, Homo erectus had expanded to about 1,000 cubic centimeters. And about 200,000 years ago, early Homo sapiens, uh, such as ourselves, had 1,200, 1,250 cubic centimeters. And then, as we've seen earlier in this talk, uh, we went, we go blacks, whites, and East Asians in increasing brain size differences. The same kind of chart over evolutionary time could have been mapped for almost any of those skeletal or muscular uh, traits that I identified before. And this is something that we'll be working on over the next two or three months. Well, brain size is important not just because of its effects on um, the skeleton, but because, of course, it's the mediator of behavior. And the social behavior you see in group averages is exactly what you would expect from uh, the group averages in brain size. The, this is a um, slide is taken from Jared Taylor's uh, very masterful piece of work, The Color of Crime. Uh, essentially, it shows arrest rates um, from FBI statistics uh, over the 1990s, and as you can see, blacks are disproportionately represented in arrests of all kinds of crimes relative to whites. And the interesting thing is, at least to my eyes, that East Asians are underrepresented on all of those measures. Remember, East Asians have the higher brains and the slightly higher IQs, and they have the more advanced behavior patterns as well, as evidenced by this slide. And I think Jared Taylor really has to be congratulated. He's not an academic, but uh, this is a very academically, scientifically sound piece of work because he validated these results against victimization surveys and all kinds of other measures to show that they essentially held up. Um, uh, Professor Glade Whitney uh, talked to us a couple of days ago about uh, his 15 minutes of fame um, recently. But you know, three or four years ago, he had another 15 minutes of fame. Uh, when he was president of the Behavior Genetics Association, uh, he gave a presidential address in Richmond, Virginia, where I was happy to be in the audience. And this was one of the slides he put up. Um, and what it basically shows is what percentage of black people there are in a state of the United States and what percentage of homicide and crime there is. And as you can see, there's an incredibly linear uh, prediction between how many blacks there are in a neighborhood and how much violent crime there is in the neighborhood. And uh, Professor Whitney uh, basically said, look, you know, these data are very solid and it's about time we behavior geneticists uh, started to study this just as we study individual variation. And uh, many of my colleagues, including, and our colleagues, including those on the executive council, actually got up and walked out of the room in protest at a data slide. Uh, so it, he didn't even say that it was genetic. Uh, I guess that was the implication, but... Um, this is... Uh, Professor Whitney and Jared Taylor have now co-authored this uh, Color of Crime and published it in an academic journal. And I think this is one of the more striking analyses that they presented. Essentially, they looked at violent crime and compared the black to white ratio and found that it was extremely similar to the male to female ratio. And I think that uh, most criminologists or behavioral scientists, even of an extremely liberal ilk, are going to pretty well accept that males do commit more crime than females, and that the reason is something to do with testosterone, it's got something to do with biology. And so the Klang association here is, uh, well, as it is between men and women, so it is between uh, blacks and whites. And if you can recall from that list of traits that I mentioned that John Entine had shown in Taboo, uh, what gives blacks the advantage uh, at sports? The very first indication was testosterone. 
3 to 19 percent more testosterone, and we know that uh, testosterone is definitely, it's a male sex hormone, it goes everywhere in the body, it affects all kinds of brain and behavior patterns, and it does indeed predispose uh, to violent crime. Uh, now Glade Whitney and I are working on a piece of uh, a study together. Um, we're looking to see to the degree to which the crime rates that you find in the United States or that Richard Lynn showed us operated in England are also international. And so we're looking at Interpol data where essentially we look at African countries, uh, Caribbean countries as representative of blacks, uh, East Asian, Pacific Rim countries as representative of East Asians, and Europe as a representative of white countries. And essentially, as you can see there, um, Asians and whites have a very small percentage of violent crime relative to African uh, countries. So it's an international phenomenon. Uh, whatever the causes of black crime is, it has nothing to do with the specific local conditions in the United States or in Canada or in Britain. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And the interesting thing is that you get exactly the same international pattern with AIDS. Now everybody reads in the papers about African AIDS and so on, and it is indeed completely out of control in Africa. Uh, at the moment on conservative figures, it's 8% of the entire African continent uh, is either 8% of the 15 to 49 year old population is either living with um, HIV or AIDS. What's much less known is that 2% of black Americans are also, one out of every 50 black Americans. And it is generally considered among epidemiologists that when this any area gets to be 2%, at that point it is considered out of control. The growth rate is uh, out of control. And so uh, the US black AIDS population is about to explode. And the interesting thing is, which again is very rarely talked about in the media, is that the black Caribbean is just the same as black Americans. Uh, some places like Haiti, it is almost African levels with 6% of the population. And this is, doesn't really matter where in the Caribbean you go, whether you go out to Bermuda, way out in the middle of the North Atlantic, or um, down to uh, uh, Guyana in Venezuela, there's a two and a half thousand mile band of islands that shows this 2%. And there's very little trade back and forth between black Africa and the black Caribbean. The only common feature is that there are black genes there and those black genes are causing the individuals in those places to behave in similar ways. And at the other extreme, US Asians behave just like East Asians. That is, they have less sexual promiscuity, less sexual diseases of all kinds uh, than do whites. Uh, okay. okay, Race, Evolution and Behavior, the book. Um, that Jared was kind enough to plug at the beginning of my talk. Uh, as some of you know, the book came out in um, 1995, I think was the first edition. It did go into a Japanese translation in 1996. It was a second edition came out by Transaction Publishers, my publisher, in 1997. Um, and just last year, this version came out, the special abridged edition. And it's a sort of a Reader's Digest version with you know, really simplified uh, statements of what it was all about. And um, Transaction brought it out for me. Uh, we printed up 100,000 copies, mainly to distribute free. And we started off with academics. Transaction mailed out 35,000 copies to psychologists, sociologists, and anthropologists that they had lists of. I mailed it out to about 10,000 people from the University of Western Ontario. And then all hell broke loose. Uh, a group called the Progressive Sociologists were uh, several other anti-racist groups essentially rose up and told transaction, threatened transaction with very dire consequences if they, if they didn't stop um, distributing the book. 
they were going to be denied uh, booths at various conventions, uh, advertising space in various journals, uh, there'd be boycotts and so on by people of their journals and books. And so for a small academic publisher, which is what transaction is, this would have been um, the end. And so they told me essentially that they wanted to burn 55,000 copies or pulp them, I'm not really sure how they get rid of 55,000 copies. Um, and would I mind, and would I mind not bringing out another special abridged edition? And I said, well, no, I, I guess I do mind, and I am going to bring out another uh, abridged edition, and I'll distribute it myself. Um, so they returned the entire copyright to me. So now, the third edition of my book is about to come out. I'm self-publishing it. And 200,000 copies of the abridged edition, uh, which should be out in about two, two and a half months. And I'm just going to give them away to as many people that uh, could possibly want them. So just write to me in a couple of months if you want some. I'll be happy to send you box loads of them. Thank you very much. It's very amazing the uh, data that you have on the IQ in Africa being two standard deviations lower than the white average. And the response I think that most lay people give is incredulity about that low of an IQ. For example, how, how can a society that has that average even function? How can they even have a society when they are borderline mentally retarded? And the other is that there are some historical examples. For example, uh, of about 200 years ago, the Haitians rose up against the, the French colonialists and uh, exterminated the white people on that island. Uh, Napoleon responded by sending an army to Haiti to reconquer this valuable colony of his. That army was defeated. Uh, Napoleon sent another reinforcements. They too were defeated. And one might ask from a skeptical point of view, how can people who are on average borderline mentally retarded defeat one of Napoleon's armies? Uh, what, what is your, your response? Well, I, I can't answer about the specific of the Napoleonic Wars in Haiti because I don't know too much about them. But the, the, the general, oh, yeah, the diseases and so on. But the general question of, you know, is Africa a functioning society? Um, you know, you, there's, there's just a lot of debate about that. Um, in South Africa, of course, there's a white elite that still keeps the country together. Um, you know, I, I, it, it is absolutely a puzzle. It's just one of the unsolved puzzles. Um, maybe at that low level, um, African IQ is different in meaning somehow uh, than a white IQ. It may still be as predictive, um, but it doesn't imply the kind of retardation, the social retardation. Arthur Jensen got into this business in the first place because uh, teachers were calling him up and saying, look, I don't understand it. I've got two children here, a white child with an IQ of 70 and a black child with an IQ of 70, and they're completely different. If you go to the playground and look at the white child with an IQ of 70, he looks a bit funny. Uh, he, you know, he's not playing with all the other children. He, he's not really a social animal. Um, he does everything inappropriately. But the black kid with an IQ of 70 uh, might be very popular in the peer group. He knows the names of all his people. He can play on the swings and the roundabouts and so on. Um, he has no trouble. Uh, so the teachers would say, well, sh so maybe he's not really got an IQ of 70. Maybe there's something wrong with a test. And Arthur Jensen then did more tests on these particular children and found, no, that was their abstract reasoning level of intelligence. But at the social level, there's no question that uh, Africans with an IQ of 70 do not behave much better, much more functional than do white children with IQs of 70. But anyway, so the, I don't know what the answer is. So the short answer is, yeah. Uh, I was wondering what your reception was uh, in Japan, translation. Uh, I get a lot of good correspondence from Japan. Um, 
th there was one Japanese professor who sent me four volumes of work, all his work, looking at uh, the skeleton of Japanese white hybrid uh, offspring. So that there are many children born in Japan of white servicemen, uh, American servicemen and Japanese mothers. And then of course there are a lot of uh, Japanese white mixtures in America. And he'd gone around the world studying this for 20 or 30 years. And consistently he always found that the, um, the Japanese white hybrids were intermediate between the Japanese population and the white population on average, which is what you would expect. Um, and that's just one indication I've had uh, invitations to go there and speak. Uh, they don't seem to be anywhere near as politically correct as uh, we are in North America. Um, given the higher IQ of uh, Northeast Asians, do you have any theories as to why uh, their civilization hasn't given as much to the world, why they haven't invented as many things, et cetera? You know, it, the trouble with this uh, whole field being so riddled with taboos and corrupt in academia is that there are so few scientists addressing what are obviously fascinating questions. Questions such as the one you've asked uh, is fundamentally interesting. I mean, here we have a real anomaly. Uh, the East Asians seem to have a higher IQ, but they have a lower level, at the moment anyway, of cultural productivity. Uh, how can this be? But in order to address that question, academics have to first admit uh, that the higher IQ of East Asians than whites is in fact meaningful, which they, they won't do because not that they don't want whites to be below East Asians, but if they do that, then they'll have to accept that Africans are so much lower than whites. So this is another unresolved question. Uh, you mentioned you'd mailed out many copies of the abridged edition before uh, a transaction publishes destroyed the rest. Have you got any feedback from those many thousands of professors, et cetera, who you mailed them to? Yeah, I, I, in fact, of all the things I've ever done, uh, I would say that I've had more positive feedback from the mail out of that abridged edition than anything else. Um, letters and emails and phone calls, a lot of people wanting more copies to mail out. Uh, people thanking me for it, uh, like the Japanese fellow who sent me four volumes of his work and so on. So it's, it's very encouraging and it really uh, makes me want to, as I say, send out 200,000 copies, see what response I get. Um, Professor Rushton, uh, most of the advances uh, that have been most important for technology, science, uh, I imagine they are disproportionately, if not almost exclusively, the product of what we would call geniuses. And um, the Asian IQ is slightly higher than the whites, but white people have a, the IQ is more spread out. So doesn't that give us just as high a percentage of geniuses as the East Asians? Might that not be part of the explanation as far as why most uh, of, the, of the important advance, advancements for society seem to have come from the Western uh, white countries? Yeah. I I'll repeat what you just said slightly differently. Um, there, as far as I can see, there are three good reasons, three good explanations for why East Asians do in fact have a higher IQ than whites, but have not been as culturally innovative recently. The first one is, as you just said, that the bell-shaped distributions differ. Um, even though the average East Asian is higher, the standard deviation is narrower. So there's a lot more people clustered around the mean, whereas our bell-shaped curve goes out to the extreme, so we've got more geniuses than they do. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that they have a very cautious temperament, which in fact inhibits them from being especially creative. The third one, which I'm inclined to favor slightly, and I'd like to look much more into it, is that for most of history, the East Asians have in fact been ahead of white Europeans. But there have been one or two little blips uh, where we're close enough that these blips can actually sometimes put us slightly ahead. Uh, the last of which was the Black Death. Uh, the Black Death in the 1380s um, throughout Europe, for example, killed 50% or more of the population of England. Uh, this was a huge, huge loss. And like all viruses, it takes the bottom half much more than it takes the top half. 
of the IQ and social distribution. So in other words, if you lose 50% of your population, the low IQ population, then the group that's left, and they all moved into towns, by the way, right after that, that led to the Reformation, um, and the brighter ones married the brighter ones, you got a sort of mating, you, got, you spread out temporarily the uh, normal distribution, you suddenly produced a whole flowering of high IQ people. And that was, of course, the Elizabethan uh, Renaissance in England and uh, elsewhere in Western Europe. And I think that is what, in some ways, we're still living on. Um, and some of the assorted of mating movement from city to city, so high IQ people can marry high IQ people, it pushes the tail out. Um, but if that theory of mind just then is correct, what it implies is that East Asians are now reverting back up to their natural level of being slightly ahead of uh, whites. Do you have a website? Um, no, not really, not worth visiting really. But um, I do have a, a, a research institute called the Charles Darwin Research Institute and we are now, within two to three months, we'll have a big presence on the internet. We'll be, you'll be able to download the abridged edition. We hope to have um, uh, audio and video lectures of how to measure skulls and brains and things like this. We hope to cause a stir with it as well. Uh, yeah, Professor Rustin. This is well outside of my ken, but of all the uh, IQ studies that I've taken a look at, it uh, says that whites are radically, wildly disproportionate with the very highest IQs, IQs of 150, 60, or, or 70, whereas uh, East Asians, Koreans, uh, Chinese, Japanese, are much more clustered around the average. And so while their average is slightly higher than whites, of the top category, the top 1% of IQs, the whites are, are wildly disproportionate repre uh, represented in that very highest category. Yeah, that point was just made by a previous uh, questioner, and it is one of the theories that would explain why um, uh, whites make more cultural innovations. Um, I can only say it's one theory. I, I can't, it's, it's not been proven. Hello, Mr. Rushton. I uh, did read your book. I really enjoyed it. I, I believe it is the truth. Something I believe that is not talked about in uh, America now is African Americans, the elite that are at the universities. If you happen to look at a lot of their names, for instance, Lonnie Guinier, W. E. Du Bois, Broker T. Washington, Hugh Price, Cornell West, or Henry, Henry Lewis Gates Jr., all of them have a significant portion of European blood in them. And they score higher on tests than the general black, black population. I think that's never talked about. Uh, well, I completely agree with you. And on a genetic uh, hypothesis, it has to be predicted that black-white hybrids will score higher than, I, uh, will score higher than the black population as a whole. The more white admixture you have, the higher will be the IQ score. And there is a lot of evidence to support it. I mean, there is research out there. Uh, there's a famous Sandra Scars transracial adoption study, which was published in the 1990s, uh, showed exactly that, that the uh, parents who adopted black children uh, with two black parents ended up with a lower IQ child than uh, white parents who adopted an interracial child, that is a black child, but one of its parents was white. Also uh, from South Africa, the Cape Coloreds, uh, who again are a mixed race population, score with an average IQ of 85, uh, which is intermediate between the Africans of 70 and the whites of 100. I'd like to return to the uh, Asian, Caucasian question for a second. And, uh, you, you, you said that perhaps in the historical continuum that Asians have been ahead of Europeans uh, for more periods of history or longer periods of history. And as a person who that's my field of his history, I would contest that. Uh, the great earliest civilizations were almost all Indo-European. And even, uh, there's a lot of evidence today, in fact, that even the Asian civilizations, such as China, that Europeans introduced the wheel 
and many other the very basics of domestication of the horse, for instance, to the uh, to the Asian people. And I, one explanation I'd like you to comment on, and this is the basis of my question, is Michael Levin said something very perceptive in his book Why Race Matters when he mentioned the fact that he ha he made the hypothesis that that high IQ in connection with higher testosterone levels led to achievement, and a slight, slightly higher testosterone level with low IQ led to criminal. Well, that's what I thought you said, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, well, one of the scientists, anyway, said this, and I picked this up, and I thought it was Mr. Levin. But the point is, uh, do you think that the slightly higher testosterone levels in terms of uh, whites as compared to Asians could lead to that specific, that more aggression which not only could be more aggressive at slightly crime levels, but also more aggressive in terms of scientific inquiry, uh, conquest, the scientific interest, the Faustian spirit that represents European mankind. Yes, I certainly do. I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought that Professor Levin would have disagreed with it. Maybe he's just disagreeing with the person who asked the question. I don't know. Oh, but anyway, um, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that creative genius requires a certain amount of what is sometimes called psychopathy, uh, a little bit of erratic behavior, a little bit of uh, extra boldness in thinking, uh, just to go that, those several steps further. And if it's channeled into a high IQ, socially productive channel, then you get genius. And if it's true that Orientals have less testosterone, then they're going to produce fewer of those geniuses. So I think that's an eminently sensible um, hypothesis. I'm sorry to have to bring this to an end, but we're out of time. And, uh... <laughs>